This video introduces the interesting narrative of the life of a Laude Equiano. This is an exciting moment in class. With Equiano's autobiography, we shift from looking at the world from the perspective of a white man like Chaucer or Shakespeare to seeing the world as an African man did. Equiano's narrative is one of the earliest texts in English by a black person. It isn't the first. Equiano's life was published in 1789. 17 years before that, the autobiography of Akasa Granisa, an African man from Bornu, now called Nigeria, was published. One year later, in 1773, Phyllis Wheatley, who was born in West Africa, published a book of poetry in the United States. Here are some dates to help you situate Equiano's narrative, which brings us far beyond the time of Shakespeare, some 180 years. Another key date to consider is 1607, when the first permanent British settlement in England was established in North America. By Equiano's time, the British Empire was the largest in the world with respect to land and people. Commerce had exploded in England. It had reached global proportions and depended heavily on slavery and the colonies. Equiano was 44 years old when his narrative was published. He was born in 1745 in Igbo, in what is now southern Nigeria. I'll begin this introduction by looking at two aspects of the reception of Equiano's narrative. First of all, white readers have exhibited a certain racist anxiety over whether he actually wrote the text. The literary critic Paul Edwards generated an important edition of Equiano's text. His introduction to that edition appears in the Norton edition of Equiano. A good chunk of of that introduction sets out to prove that Equiano actually wrote the text. Edwards looks at internal evidence from the text, personal letters, as well as Equiano's use of African words to prove that he really wrote it. This anxiety over Equiano's authority intersects with the fact that early slave narratives typically appeared with a letter of authentication by a white person. Literary critic Robert Steptoe makes an invaluable point about such letters of authentication. They do precisely the opposite of what they are intended to do. Instead of authenticating the narratives, they diminish them. By their very existence, claims regarding authenticity undermine the author and validate the impulses of audiences to question the authenticity of such narratives. Another related element of the reception of Equiano's text is an anxiety over whether Equiano's representation of Africa is accurate. Such concerns emerge partly from Professor Vincent Coretta, who points to documents that suggest that Equiano was born in South Carolina. Yet again, white people have doubted Equiano's authority. Let me be clear. There is no doubt that this book was written by Equiano. Moreover, the prospect that Equiano may have been born in the U.S. doesn't diminish his text. Rather, it suggests its resonance with the vital category of creative nonfiction. In other words, this text is highly, deeply, and learnedly literary. With regard to the question of Africa's portrayal in the narrative, I suggest that the best way to approach this issue is to not wonder over, be preoccupied by its authenticity, but instead ask, what work does that representation perform? Keep in mind that the main goal of the text is to inspire the English to abolish slavery. So how does Equiano's portrayal of Africa meet that goal? This is a dense, difficult, and brilliant work of art. Due to its density, I have slightly abridged the reading. Namely, I have not assigned chapters 4, 9, 10, and 11. You are, of course, free to go ahead and read those chapters if you wish. They are fantastic. This week, you are reading just the first two chapters. Chapter 1 offers an account of life in the part of Africa 
where Ekriano came from, that is, the area that is now southern Nigeria. Chapter 2 describes how Equiano and his sister were abducted in their home village, his horrible separation from his sister, his journey from inland Nigeria to the coast, his shocking encounter with a slave ship, and finally his journey on that ship to Barbados in the West Indies or the Caribbean. I'll end by touching on some of the issues that scholars have debated regarding Equiano's narrative. A major area of contention is whether we should categorize the book as African American or African British. While the book was published in England, Equiano didn't just live there, but in the U.S. Many Americanist scholars, in fact, claim the narrative as an American text. A second key area of debate is religion. A major question is, how should we approach Equiano's relationship to Christianity? Is this a sincerely pious text? Or is something more complex going on? Could the turn to religion at some level be strategic? That is, does he bring up religion for the sake of meeting his overall goal of abolishing slavery? A third question pertains to economics. As with Equiano's statements about the Christian faith, should we be taking his claims about commerce and trade at face value, or again, is something more complex and contradictory going on? Is he invoking those issues strategically to convert readers to his abolitionist cause? Finally, a hotly discussed topic is Equiano's narrative voice. As many readers have noticed, Equiano shifts between at least two voices in his text. One voice is that of Equiano as a young man encountering European white culture for the first time and thus not knowing much about it. The other voice is that of an older Equiano, the person who is writing the narrative, who has received a Western education, who has converted to Christianity, and has, it seems, a more knowing and experienced voice. Again, I urge you to consider these voices as self-conscious, intentional components of the narrative. That is, how might the childlike voice, seemingly full of wonder, serve Equiano's purpose of critiquing white civilization?